Okay, do you uh, have, well, take your Bibles and go to Acts 14. Do you have the little handout, the little half sheet handout this morning? Does anybody not have the handout? Let me ask you that question, it that way. Do we have more? Daniel, I think they're back there on the stand. Acts 14. This lesson is a little bit out of order. It got delayed a week um, because of something I needed to cover last week. So we're going back into Acts 14. Um, because I had promised you that we would talk about common grace. And I, I want us to do that because um, it's going to come up again in Acts 17 at Mars Hill. And we're at the point in the book of Acts where there's this major transition toward pagan idolatrous audiences instead of people with some connection to Judaism. So themes like common grace are going to become more important. Um, so Acts 14, this is where what's prompting this, Acts 14 verse 17 so this is Paul and Barnabas in Lystra when they're treating them like gods. And verse 17, God did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Okay, so this is what it's not that the Bible calls this common grace, but theologians call this common grace. I put a simple definition of it from Grudem on your handout. Common grace is the grace of God by which he gives people innumerable blessings that are not part of salvation. So the word common doesn't mean the blessings are just common. It means they're common to everyone. They're not a specific blessing of God upon his, his people um, that he has saved. So on your handout, I have a list of passages um, and I was going to have you break up into groups to do this, but I forgot to ask you to do that. But I think you're sitting well enough that we can, we can still do this. So what I'm going to ask you to do is work through those passages for the next um, about 20 minutes here and um, try to answer the questions that are on the handout based on those passages. And um, do try not to get too off topic. There are other things you could start talking about in those passages. Uh, just try to stay on the topic of common grace and the questions that are on the handout. So take about, um, we'll see how you do on time, but 15 or 20 minutes to work through those passages and answer those questions together, and then we'll come back and wrap together some conclusions about that. All right, everybody has the handout? So go ahead and Figure out your groups and go for it. All right. Let's come back together now, even if you didn't quite make it through. What are some of the ways common grace can be seen? Quickly, just give some of the answers. Well, that's broad. Yes. <laughs> All right, that wraps that up. <laughs> food, tasty food. Seasons. Seasons, and particularly seasons that bring fruitfulness, seasons that relate to the tasty food, as well as seasons that bring day and night and cool and heat and those things, right? Good. The regularity, the predictability of those, the way those feed into the seasons and the tasty food. Things that bring satisfaction, things that bring gladness, right? Delayed judgment. Delayed judgment. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's what makes them common, right? Rain, sunlight. And uh, who we give our love and greeting to and who sometimes perhaps maybe we choose not to. You mean um, people? Is that what you mean? Yeah, uh, in verse uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, mm -hmm. the gift of sunlight and rain, and then it goes on to say, all 
also who be careful of who you don't be selective of who you give oh, yeah. and mm -hmm. to. Right. And what was in Romans 13? I know that was the last passage. Did somebody get there? Does that introduce as an important category? Authorities, government, structures. What, what other things do you think would fit into that same category of God-given structures that can benefit humanity in addition to government? Family. family? Aren't there all kinds of godless people who benefit from the structure of the family? Right. More than that? I mean, some, all of these things can be distorted, so some of the answers can be tricky, but I think education. education is definitely one of the answers, right? Yeah, it can be distorted, but those kind of structures are God's mercy. Good. Work. Church is a structure by God, from God, right? And, and you know what? This is a tricky point, but having grown up in a place like Utah, um, um, false religions that the more kernels of truth false religions have in them, the more they can actually benefit society in general. In other words, Utah was a great place to grow up in, partly because even though I think they have missed the gospel, there's all this morality that's pounded into the Mormon people, you know? And so Utah was a wonderful place to grow up in for those reasons. So what is that? That's, that's not God's saving benefits, but that is a, a benefit from God through the structure of these things. So we could add probably to these things on this list um, some things that aren't necessarily named in these passages, like, um, but, but I think are implied, like human creativity, the arts, all of the beneficial discoveries and advances of science and technology, um, uh, Foss check. <laughs> you see that stuff this week? Unbelievable. Them lining the back of those homes in Lake Elsinore. How many, how many different examples of common grace are there in the fact that those houses are standing at the foot of those hills in Lake Elsinore in South Corona? Everything from engineers who create airplanes to chemists who create fire retardant to the courage of firefighters to stand in backyards with 25-foot flames and defend houses. That's just common grace on common grace on common grace on common grace on common grace uh, in, those, in those moments. So these are all examples of things that all human beings can benefit from. And when we say all human beings, we don't mean that all people receive the same benefits but that these benefits, again, they're not unique to just saved people. That's what we mean. What aspects of God's character does common grace display? What was named in the passages? Mercy. Mercy. Kindness. Kindness. Forbearance. Patience. Love. Tricky question you run across all the time. Does God love unsaved people? And the answer is yes and no in two different senses. It's, it's a clear Bible answer. Um, you, you have like in Mark chapter 10, Jesus looks on this unsaved man who is going to reject him, and it says Jesus loved him. And so there is this clear sense in which, as we saw reflected in these passages, God demonstrates his love toward all people. And then there is this other sense in which the love of God is only in Christ Jesus our Lord, and it is only for God's people. And God only loves them in the Romans 8 sense. So the, the, the answer is that both things are true. There's a clear biblical sense in which God loves all people and a clear biblical sense in which there is a specific love that is only for his people. Um, both things are true. But, so there is a type of God's love, an aspect of God's love that is common grace that's for all people. Okay, so we've gotten mercy, love, kindness, forbearance, patience. What else? Good. So his goodness. Uh-huh. 
Acts 14 and Romans 13. Romans 2, our repentance, so then hence, are we implying God's forgiveness? Okay, that's a little tricky. You're right that common grace is one of the things that should bring people to repentance. It's a little bit different to say that common grace displays God's forgiveness. Um, you see what I'm saying there? In, in other words, you have the question on your sheet, what can common grace not display? And the good general answer to that question is the gospel. Common grace cannot display the gospel. So I think common grace can imply that you need to turn to God, but common grace can't tell you that God's going to forgive you. That is the word of Christ. That has to, act, has to actually come through the revelation of words connected to, to Jesus. Does that make sense what I'm saying? There. Common grace can't display the gospel, but it can be a summons to repentance. Okay, what else? Psalm 19. The glory of God. Uh huh. Romans 1. The fact of a creator. Yes. Uh huh. His eternal power and divine nature. In Romans 1, yes? Invisible attributes, which would probably be those eternal power and handiwork, Psalm 19.1. Acts 14.17, he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving. So what aspect of that, if God's character is that? Generosity. So I think we have God's kindness, His patience, His love, His mercy, His goodness, His generosity, His glory, His handiwork, His eternal power and divine nature, His, his godness, his, create, his place as creator. People long to be understood, and I think it's interesting how Jesus, I believe, the Bible says that God understands our frame, He knows we're dust, mm. and I think it's a Right, it's, it reminds us that when we, you know, when, when we have something like Second Corinthians four, not looking at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen, you know, we need to understand that in terms of what Paul meant, and not beyond what Paul meant to mean. There's nothing for you to see that can encourage you, point you to God, or anything like that. There are all kinds of things for us to see to point us to God. Um, we just can't. We have to see them, maybe we'd say it this way, we have to see them in tandem with the unseen things. You have to be seeing both the unseen and God's hand in the scene at the same time, but they're both there. So what does common grace accomplish? First of all, what's the word in Acts 14 verse 17 for what it accomplishes? This is important. And I, I'm not thinking of the word satisfying. I know that's there. But what is common grace referred to in verse 17? A witness. So common grace accomplishes a witness. It witnesses. Now, when we think of witnessing, we think of telling the gospel. That's not what this means. It doesn't mean it tells the gospel. But it does mean it testifies about God. So common grace accomplishes a witness. What else does it accomplish? Mike, I overheard your answer about judgment. You want to say that? 
Sorry? Right, it accomplishes these good things that we receive, right? Right, it establishes the justice of God's judgment. And you see that in Romans 1 and Romans 2. Because there has been this witness. Okay, good. What else, what else does it accomplish? Or could it accomplish? Romans 2, 4. As Tim said earlier, it could. What? Lead us to repentance, right? If combined with the gospel message, it could lead us to repentance. It is a witness. It establishes just judgment. What else does it accomplish? Psalm 19, it does declare the glory of God. It, it, even if people reject it, it successfully declares the glory of God. And then finally, I think it accomplishes in, in Matthew 5 and Luke 6, what does it give to us? And Matthew 5 and Luke 6, what does it give to us? It gives us a model. It gives us an example of, because you could legitimately ask the question, how are we supposed to treat evil people? And just thinking on your own, you could come up with lots of answers to that. But common grace answers the question, how you relate to ungodly and evil people. You relate to them like God does in common grace. And you see how that's really important, because sometimes we want to relate to them like God does as the sovereign creator. We want to be their judge. That's not your place. So Matthew 5 and Luke 6 don't say you should relate to evil people like the sovereign creator does as in his role as God. It says you should relate to evil people like he does in common grace. That aspect of how God relates to evil people. Um, and so that sets the model for us. How did the words of Acts 14 verse 17 indirectly confront the people of Lystra for their dependence upon idols? So it says... He did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. How is that an indirect confrontation to an agricultural community about their idols and their dependence upon idols? Chris? Chris? Exactly, exactly. He's saying, you've, all this time, you've thought you've been working your gods. You've been bringing the right gifts. You've been doing the right things. And so as a result, you've had some rain and some good crops and some fertility. And you, you thought you were working the gods. Actually, the one true God has been showing you his common grace all along. So he doesn't say it that directly, but that's clearly part of what he's communicating. Yeah, with the. Uh, yeah, the oxen are there, <laughs> as he says that. So yeah, maybe it's not entirely indirect, <laughs> right? So uh, let me let me just wrap together then a few just kind of lessons or, or principles here um, from those things. Number one it's very important for us to see that the sermon in Acts 14 got cut short. Verse 18, even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. So Paul and Barnabas didn't get to tell that crowd about Jesus, but that's not because they didn't want to. When we go to Acts 17, we'll see how Paul went from common grace to Jesus. So we don't want to misunderstand and think that this is a gospel presentation here that ends with common grace. Um, there's more to the story, but in that crazy setting, Paul and Barnabas didn't get to communicate it. So we'll see that in Acts 17. Um, secondly, 
A key word that the theologians use in this discussion is the word restrain. So the idea is that God is restraining humanity from being as evil as it would be without common grace. And even though the Bible doesn't maybe say this directly, I think it's pretty obvious that humanity would not exist without common grace. We would have self-destructed long ago. Um, So when people say, how can God allow so many bad things to happen? I mean, that's a legitimate question, and we should respond carefully and tenderly because they're probably suffering greatly. But at the same time, it's really legitimate to ask, how is God so merciful to even, even allow this planet to exist when so many people are scorning him and defaming his glory? So the existence of the human race is a miracle of mercy. God has restrained human sinfulness from going nearly as far as it would naturally go. So turn with me over then to 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter 2, verse 4, If God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if He did not spare the ancient world, referring to Noah's world, verse 6, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, He condemned them to extinction. Okay, so do you see what He's pointing us to here, examples of something different than what humanity as a whole has experienced or is experiencing today. He's pointing us to the examples of when people or angels received what they deserved right away. And what was the result of it? You know, the, 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 the great word in verse 6 is extinction, you know, destruction, The end, or verse 4, the angels, they were just cast into hell, those angels who sinned. So God immediately took the created blessings from them. I mean, I don't know, you know, immediate is a little tricky with Sodom and Gomorrah and, and Noah and the flood, but still those people had a point in their life where, boom, it was gone, it was over. Um, And for the angels, it just seems like it was immediate, but God spared us. He allowed us to continue living in the created blessings, experiencing His patience, giving us a chance to repent. So to put it in a way that is uncomfortable, but is still, I think, the best way to understand common grace, the way to understand common grace is to compare the world today, and let's pause there. Don't you hear people all the time say, the world is so terrible, the world is so awful, right? But the way to understand common grace is to compare the world today with hell. And there you see common grace. Why is the world today not hell? And yes, I know people say, I'm experiencing hell on earth when they go through something terrible. And again, we can sympathize with that and be very gracious with that, but they're not even close. Um, An unsaved person simply sitting at a stoplight Okay, I'm sitting at Newport and uh, Antelope yesterday, and there's a girl in the car next to me who has a bag from like, it was white, so it looked like like a Five Guys bag or something to me, and she's getting food out of it, and she's got a little dog on her lap who is desperately trying to get the food, so she's trying to eat and get food out and drive and handle this little dog. I'm like, and you say cell phones are the problem? (laughs) <laughs> How much common grace is at that moment? An unsaved person sitting at a stoplight, munching on a snack, listening to music. How much common grace is there? And I'm not talking about the danger of her and her dog and running into me. I'm referring to the technology she's benefiting from, the orderliness, the safety, the human engineering, the comfort, the tastiness of the food, the beauty 
even of what can be seen. You sit at a stoplight and there are, you could not even begin to count all of the blessings of common grace that are flooding into your life at that moment. I, I've kept thinking about this this week as I've thought, I, and I don't, I don't claim to understand everything and I certainly don't claim to understand the finances and all the money California is blowing through to fight these fires, but it is astonishing what they can accomplish to fight these fires. It has just staggered me to watch this the last two weeks. And that is, that is an especially interesting thing to consider because hell is depicted as fire. Why is God allowing humanity to successfully wage the war against fires and protect our homes? Because someday you're not going to win. The judgment is going to win. So, folks, we have so much more to be grateful for than we even realize. And I think a couple aspects of that. One is, one of the things I hope will come away from this morning is, be careful that you don't get a little caught up in only looking at the, like, nature and animal creation as the sign of God's common grace. I think we, we can get a little caught on that and miss the traffic engineers who created stoplights that run so that we don't just slam into each other and die. We, we more easily go to the zoo and say, ooh, look at God's hand in that, than we go to a museum and see art and say, wow, look at common grace displayed through the image of God in people and through science and technology and music and all those things. So I want to encourage us just to broaden out a little bit more. There's more to common grace than the Grand Canyon and polar bears at the zoo, though those are, of course, God's, God's common grace. But secondly, we sometimes get caught in the mindset where we're waiting for God to finally do something in our lives. We have an idea of what God could do that would really break through, change things, relieve our suffering or whatever. And we're asking, God, where are you? Why aren't you doing anything? And you've probably heard me mention the person who said to me, God hasn't done anything good for me in eight years. No, that was a deeply suffering person. And so I'm not trying to be hard on that person. Every one of us can feel that way. But in reality, even our hardest days are touched with many, many, many blessings of God. And our normal days are just drenched in his blessings. And so we really do have a lot more to be thankful for than we, I think, see. And, and so finally then, common grace, I think, reminds us, and this is kind of the point I was just making, but common grace reminds us not to make a hard distinction between the secular and the sacred. Now, all of these created things can be misused in sinful ways. But, but is rain secular? Are firefighters secular? How about art? How about memory foam mattresses? How about our legal system? How about the food supply that ends up in just packed grocery stores, stocked with everything you could imagine? How about kindergarten teachers? How about city parks? What is secular exactly? Isn't every good thing a kind gift from our Father? So, what's the condemnation in Romans chapter 1? Although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. So to all of us, the message this morning is, honor God and give thanks to Him. He is on display all around us. Our lives are drenched in His common grace. And if you, like me, have been mentally obsessed with some little thing that I think is wrong in my life or big thing that I think is wrong in my life and I wish was different, I need to stop and honor and give thanks to God for His riches poured out on me in so many ways today. <music>